When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them to the end. Having in the former treatise set forth our Lord in all those solemn actions of his, his obedience unto death, his resurrection, ascension into heaven, his sitting at God's right hand and intercession for us, I shall now annex this discourse which lays open the heart of Christ as he is now in heaven, sitting at God's right hand and interceding for us, how it is affected and graciously disposed towards sinners on earth that come to him, how willing to receive them, how ready to entertain them, how tender to pity them in all their infirmities. The use of this will be this, to encourage sinners to come more boldly to the throne of grace, to such a Savior and high priest, when they shall know how tenderly his heart, though he is now in his glory, is inclined towards them, and so to remove the great stone of stumbling which we meet with, and lies unseen in the thoughts of men. That Christ being now exalted to so high a distance of glory, as to sit at God's right hand, they cannot tell how to treat with him about their salvation so freely, as those poor sinners did who were here on earth with him. Had our lot been, they think, but to have conversed with him in the days of his flesh, as Mary and Peter, and his other disciples did here below, we could have been bold with him, and have had anything at his hands. For they beheld him before them, a man like themselves, and full of meekness and gentleness. He being then himself sensible of all sorts of miseries. But now he is gone into a far country, and is put on glory and immortality. The drift of this discourse is therefore to ascertain poor souls, that his heart remains the same as it was on earth that he intercedes there with the same heart he did here below, that he is as meek, as gentle, as easy to be entreated, and as tender in his bowels, so that you may deal with him as fairly about the great manner of your salvation, and upon as easy terms obtain it of him, as you might if you had been on earth with him, then which nothing can be more for the comfort of your poor soul. Pursue after strong and entire communion with Christ. Now the demonstrations that may help our faith in this are reduced to two heads. The one sheaving, that it is so, the other the reasons and grounds why it must needs be so. The first are taken from several passages in those several conditions of his, at his last farewell before his death, his resurrection, ascension, and now he is sitting at God's right hand. I shall lead you through all the same heads which I have gone over in the former treatise, though to another purpose, and take such observations from his speeches and carriage in all those states he went through, as shall tend directly to persuade our hearts of the point in hand, namely, that now he is in heaven. His heart remains as graciously inclined to sinners that come to him as ever on earth. And for a ground or introduction to the first, I shall take the scripture above set down, for those other, another scripture. Section 1. Demonstrations of Christ's love to sinners now from his last farewell to his disciples. It was long before Christ opened his mind to his disciples that he was to go away to heaven from them. But when he begins to acquaint them with it, he at once leaves with them an abundance of his heart. And that not only how it stood towards them at the present, but what it would be when he should be in his glory. Let us to this end but briefly peruse his last carriage and his last supper, as it is recorded by the evangelist John, and we shall find this to be the drift of those long discourses from the 13th to the 18th chapter. 
The words which I have prefixed as the text are the preface to all that discourse, and show the argument and sum of it all. The preface is this. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he then washed his disciples' feet. Now this preface was prefixed by the evangelist on purpose, to set open a window into Christ's heart, to show what it was at his departure, and to give a light into all that follows. Number one. He premises what was in Christ's thoughts. He began deeply to consider, both that he was to depart out of this world, and that he should shortly be installed into that glory which was due to him. So it follows in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that is, that all power in heaven and earth was his in the midst of these thoughts, went and washed his disciples' feet. What was Christ's heart most upon in the midst of all these elevated meditations? Not upon his own glory so much, though it is told us he considered that, by this the more to set out his love to us. But his heart ran out in love towards his own. Having loved his own, says the first verse, the word denoting the greatest nearness, dearness, and intimateness founded upon propriety. All believers are Christ's own, a piece of himself, his own members, his own flesh. And he considers that though he was to go out of the world, yet they were to be in the world, and therefore it is added, which were in the world that is, to remain in this world. He had others of his own who were in that world to which he was going, even the spirits of just men made perfect. But he takes more care for his own who were to remain here in this world, a world in which there is much evil, both of sin and misery. This is it which draws out his bowels towards them. Even when his heart was full of the thoughts of his own glory, Having loved his own, he loved them to the end, or forever. So that the scope of this speech is to show how Christ's heart and love would be towards them even forever when he should be gone to his Father, as well as it was to show how it had been here on earth, and to testify what his love would be to them when in heaven. The evangelist skews that when he was in the midst of all those great thoughts of his approaching glory, he then took water and a towel and washed his disciples' feet. And what was Christ's meaning in this but that, whereas when he was in heaven he could not make such outward visible demonstrations of his heart by doing such mean services for them, Therefore, by doing this in the midst of such thoughts of his glory, he would show what he could be content, as it were, to do for them, when he should be in full possession of it. This declaration of his mind we have from his carriage, at this his last farewell. Let us next take a survey of the drift of that which he made in that his farewell discourse, and we shall find the main scope of it to be, further to assure his disciples of what his heart would be to them, and is what he prayed for them, was for all believers, so also was that which he spoke to them. First, he lets them see what his heart would be to them when in heaven, by that busyness which he went there to perform for them. I go to send you a comforter while you are in this world and to prepare a place for you, John 14, verse 2, when you go out of this world. There are many mansions in my Father's house, and I go to take them up for you. If it had been otherwise, he says, I would have told you. Who would not this openness of heart persuade? 
but then the business itself being so much for our happiness. How much more does that argue? It, and indeed, Christ himself does fetch from this an argument of the continuance of his love to them. So in verse 3, If I go to prepare a place for you, then don't doubt of my love when I am there. All the glory of the place shall never make me forget my business. When he was on earth, he never forgot the business for which he came into the world. And now he has gone to heaven. He has entered as a forerunner to take up places there for us. And therefore, in First Peter 1, verse 4, salvation is said to be reserved in heaven for us. And further to manifest his mindfulness of them and of all believers. When he should be in his glory, he tells them that when he has dispatched that business for them, he meant to come again to them. So chapter 14, verse 3. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Love descends better than us sins, and so does the love of Christ, who indeed is love itself, and therefore comes down to us himself, and receive you to myself, Christ says, that so where I am you may be also, and yet further, the more to express the longings of his heart after them all during that time, he tells them it shall not be long Neither ere he does come again to them. So John 16, verse 16. Again a little while, and you shall see me. A little while, and you shall not see me. Which not see in him refers not to that small space of absence, while dead in the grave, but to that after his ascending, when he should go away, not to be seen on earth again until the day of judgment. Thirdly, what his heart would be towards them in his absence. He expresses by the careful provision he would make for their comfort in his absence. John 14, verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans, so the word is. I will not leave you like fatherless and friendless children. My father, and I have only one, who lies in the bosom of us both and proceeds from us both and the Holy Ghost, and in the meantime I will send him to you, verse 16. I will pray the Father, says he, and he shall give you another comforter. In chapter 16, verse 7, he says, I will send him to you, and he shall be a better comforter to you than I am to be in this dispensation. It is expedient that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come who by reason of his office will comfort you better than I should do with my bodily presence. And his spirit, as he is the earnest of heaven, so he is the greatest token and pledge of my love that ever was. And all the comfort he shall speak to you all that while will be but the expression of my heart towards you. For as he comes not of himself, but I must send him, John 16, verse 7, so he will speak nothing of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Verse 13. In verse 14, he shall receive of mine, and shall show it to you. Him therefore I shall send on purpose to be in my room, and he shall tell you, if you listen to him and not grieve him, nothing but my love. He shall glorify me, namely to you, for I am in myself already glorified in heaven. All his speech in your hearts will be to advance me and my love to you, and it will be his delight to do it. And he will continually be breaking your hearts, either with my love to you or yours to me or both. And whereas you have the Spirit now, he now dwells with you. And at that day, verse 20, you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He will tell you when I am in heaven that there is a true conjunction between me and you as is between my Father and me. If this were not enough to assure them how his heart would be affected towards them, he assures them he will give them daily experience of it. Hitherto you have asked nothing, that is, but little, in my name. But now ask, and you shall receive." And if otherwise you will not believe, 
Believe me, he says, for the work's sake. John 14, verse 11. He speaks here of the works he would do for them in answer to their prayers when he was gone, for it follows in verse 12. He that believes on me shall do greater works than I, because I go to my Father. So that it is manifest, he speaks of the works done after his ascension. And how are they to procure them to be done? By prayer, so it follows, verse 13. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do. He speaks it of the time when he is gone. And again in verse 14, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. As if he had said, though you ask the Father in my name, yet all come through my hands, and I will do it. Yet further to evidence his love, he not only bids them pray to him, and in his name upon all occasions, but assures them that he himself will pray for them. It is the chief work that he does in heaven. He lives ever to intercede. As he ever lives, so he lives to intercede, ever, and never holds his peace until sinners are saved. In the last place, read but the 17th chapter, and you shall see that he presently goes apart to his father and speaks over all again to him, which he had said to them. That chapter, you know, contains a prayer put up just before his suffering, and there he makes his will and his last request. For it runs in this style, Father, I will, verse 24 which will he has gone to see executed in heaven. And this prayer is left us by Christ as a summary of his intercession for us in heaven. He spoke as he meant to do in heaven, and as one that had done his work and was now come to demand his wages. I have finished my work which you gave me to do, he says in verse 4. And whereas he speaks a word or two for himself in the first five verses, he speaks five times as many for them. For all the rest of the chapter is a prayer for them. He uses all kinds of arguments to move his father for his children. I have finished the work which you gave me to do, he says. And to save them is your work, which remains to be done for me by you. And they are yours, and you gave them to me. I come in to you, but your own. And he says, though you have given me a personal glory, which I had before the world was. Yet there is another glory which I regard almost as much, and that is, in their being saved. I am glorified in them, verse 10, and they are my joy, verse 13, and therefore I must have them with me wherever I am, verse 24. You have set your heart upon them, and have loved them yourself as you have loved me. I will that they be where I am, verse 24, that they may behold the glory which you have given me. He speaks all this as if he had been then in heaven and in possession of all that glory. Section 2. Demonstrations from the passages and expressions after his resurrection. Christ's resurrection was the first step to his glory. When he laid down his body, he laid down all earthly weakness, it was sown, as ours is, in weakness. But with raising it again, he took on him the qualifications of an immortal and glorious body. It was raised in power. And therefore, what is hard upon his first rising shall appear to be towards us, will be a certain demonstration what it will continue to be in heaven. To illustrate this the more, consider that if ever there were a trial taken, whether his love to sinners would continue or not, it was then at his resurrection. For all his disciples, especially Peter, had carried themselves the most unworthily towards him. Now in Christ came first out of the other world, clothed with that hardened body which he was to wear in heaven. What message since he first to them? We would all think, that as they would not know him in his suffering, so he would now be estranged to them in his glory, or at least his first words would be of their faithlessness and falsehood. No, his first word concerning them is, Go tell my brethren, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. You read elsewhere that it was great love and condescension in Christ, so to entitle them, 
Hebrews 2 verse 11. He is not ashamed to call them brethren, and for him to call them so he was entering into his glory, argues the more love. He carries it as Joseph did in the height of his advancement. When he first opened his mind to his brethren, he said, I am Joseph, your brother. So Christ says here, tell them you have seen Jesus, their brother. I own them as brethren still. But what was the message that he would have delivered to them? That I, he says, ascend to my father and your father. A more friendly speech by far than that of Joseph, though that was full of bowels. For Joseph, after he had told him he was their brother adds, whom you sold into Egypt. He reminds him of their unkindness, but not so Christ. He doesn't remind them of what they had done against him, but even more you may observe that he reminds them not so much of what he had been doing for them. He doesn't say, tell them I have been dying for them, or that they little think what I have suffered for them. Not a word of that either. But still his heart is upon doing more. He doesn't look backward to what is past, but forgets his sufferings as a woman her travel, for joy that a man-child is born. Having now dispatched that great work on earth for them, he hastens to heaven to do another. And though he knew he had business yet to do upon earth, that would hold him forty days longer, yet to show that his heart was longing to be at work for them in heaven, he speaks in the present tense and tells them, I ascend, and he expresses his joy, not only that he goes to his father, but also that he goes to their father to be an advocate for them. And is indeed Jesus our brother alive? And does he call us brethren? And does he talk thus lovingly of us? Whose heart would not this overcome? But this was but a message sent his disciples before he met them. Let us next observe his courage at his meeting them. When he came first amongst them, this was his salutation. Peace be to you. It is all one with that speech of his used in parting. My peace I leave with you. After this, he breathes on them and conveys the Holy Ghost in a further measure to them, so to give an evidence of what he would do more plentifully in heaven. And a mystery of that, his breathing on them, was to show that this was the utmost expression of his heart, to give them the Spirit, as well as that the Holy Ghost proceeds from him, as well as from the Father. And to what end does he give them the Spirit? Not for themselves alone, but that they by the gifts and assistance of that Spirit, might forgive men's sins, by converting them to him. Whose sins soever ye remit, namely by your ministry, they are remitted to them. His mind, you see, is still upon sinners, and his care for the conversion of their souls. And therefore his last words, as they are recorded by Luke, are, Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise that repentance and remission of sins should be preached among all nations, and adds, beginning at Jerusalem, where he had been but a few days before crucified. Of all places, one would have thought he would have accepted that, but he bids them to begin there. Let them have the first benefit by my death, that were the actors in it. Afterwards, indeed, when he appears to the eleven, he upbraids them, but with what? With their unbelief and hardness of heart? No sin of theirs troubled him but their unbelief, which skews how his heart stands, and that he desires nothing more than to have men believe in him, and this now when glorified. Another time he shows himself to his disciples, and particularly deals with Peter, but yet tells him not a word of his sins nor of his forsaking of him, but only goes about to draw from him a testimony of his love to himself. Peter, he says, Do you love me? Christ loves to hear that. Full well do those words sound in his ears when you tell him you love him, though he knows it already. And what was Christ's aim in drawing this acknowledgement from Peter that if he loved him he should feed his lambs? 
This is a great testimony of love that he would have Peter show him when he should be in heaven. And how great a testimony is this? How well Christ's heart was affected to the souls of men, that their salvation was his greatest care. And to what end does the evangelist record these things of him after his resurrection? One of the evangelists informs us, These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that you might come to him as a savior of the world, and that believing you might have life through his name. Section 3 demonstrations from passages at and after his ascension. Let us next view Christ in his ascending. His courage then also will further assure our hearts of his desire for the happiness of mankind. He lifted up his hands and blessed them, and that we might the more observe it, it is added. And while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. This benediction Christ reserved to be his last act. And what was the meaning of it but to bless them as God blessed Adam and Eve, bidding them increase and multiply, and so blessing all mankind that were to come of them. Thus does Christ in blessing his disciples bless all those that shall believe through their word to the end of the world. This is interpreted by Peter in Acts 3 verse 26 when speaking to the Jews he says, Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and how in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. In the next place, let us consider what Christ did when he was come to heaven. How abundantly did he make good all that he had promised in his last discourse? For first, he instantly poured out his spirit. He then received it and visibly poured it out. And the Spirit is still in our preaching, and in your hearts and hearing, in praying, in reading, and in holy meditation, and persuades you of Christ's love to this very day. And is in all these a pledge of the continuance of Christ's love still in heaven to sinners? All our sermons and your prayers are evidences to you that Christ's heart is still the same towards sinners. For the Spirit that assists in all these comes in his name and works all by commission from him. And do none of you feel your hearts moved in the preaching of these things? At this and other times? And who is it that moves you? It is the Spirit which speaks in Christ's name, even as himself is said to speak from heaven, Hebrews 12, verse 25. And when you pray, it is the Spirit that makes intercession for you, in your own hearts, Romans 8:26, which intercession of his is but the evidence and echo of Christ's intercession in heaven. The Spirit prays in you because Christ prays for you. He is an intercessor on earth because Christ is an intercessor in heaven. He also follows us to the sacrament, and in that, and in the mirror of that, shows us Christ's face smiling on us, and thus we go away rejoicing that we saw our Savior that day. Again, all those works in answer to the apostles' prayers are a demonstration of this. The apostles went on to preach forgiveness through Christ, and in his name, and what signs and wonders did accompany them, to confirm that their preaching and all were the fruits of Christ's intercession in heaven, so that what he had promised, as that evidence of his minding them in heaven, was abundantly fulfilled. They, upon his asking, did greater works than he. The apostle makes an argument of it. How shall we escape, he says, if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles. Yea, let me add that take all the New Testament and all the promises in it, all was written since Christ's being in heaven by his Spirit, and that by commission from Christ. And therefore all that you find in it you may build on, as his very heart, and therein see that once he once said on earth, he repealed not a word now that he is in heaven, Thirdly, some of the same apostles spoke with him since, even many years after his ascension. 
so John and Paul, of which the last was in heaven with him, and they both give out the same thing of him. Paul received the gospel from no man but by the immediate revelation of Jesus Christ from heaven. He was converted by the immediate speech of Christ himself, and this long after his ascension. And in that one instance, Christ abundantly spewed his purpose to continue to all sorts of sinners, to the end of the world. So that great apostle tells us, For this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to all them that should hereafter believe on him. It is expressed, you see, to assure all sinners to the end of the world of Christ's heart towards them. Then again, sixty years after his ascension, did the Apostle John receive a revelation from him. And the revelation is said to be, in a more immediate manner, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you read that Christ appeared to him and said, I am he that was dead, and am alive forevermore. Revelation 1 verse 18. Now let us but consider Christ's last words in that his last book. The last that Christ had spoken since he went to heaven, or that he is to utter till the day of judgment. Jesus, having sent mine angel to testify to you the things in the churches, I am the root and offspring of David, and the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Christ was now in heaven, and had before promised to come again, and fetch all his disciples to heaven. In the meantime, mark what an echoing and answering of hearts and desires there is between him from heaven, and believing sinners from below. Earth calls upon heaven, as the prophet speaks. The bride from earth says to Christ, Come to me. And the saints' hearts below say, Come unto him also. And Christ also calls aloud from heaven, Come, and answer to this desire in them. So heaven and earth ring again of it. Let him that is a thirst come to me. And let him that will come and take of the water of life freely. This is Christ's speech to men on earth. They call him to come to earth to judgment, and he calls sinners to come up to heaven to him for mercy. They cannot desire his coming to them so much as he desires their coming to him. All which shows how much his heart was engaged to invite sinners to him, that now when he is to speak, but one sentence more, till we hear the sound to judgment, he should especially make choice of these words. Let them therefore forever stick with you as being worthy to be your last thoughts when you come to die and are going to him. He speaks indeed something after them, but that is but to set a seal to these words and to the rest of the scriptures and to intimidate his willingness to come quickly. And all this tends to assure us that this is his heart and we shall find him of no other mind until his coming again.